first the opening of uh, Thomas Paine, Common Sense. These are the times that trouble men's souls. It's true, isn't it? But they persevered. And God gave them victory. So we're going to do the same thing. What a great crowd. What a good turnout tonight. How many of you are here to hear, were here to hear? How many of you were present to hear? My brother, Tim. Good. I always have to follow him and clean up some of the messes he makes. It's been my challenge all my life to do it. So I don't see it. Uh, I didn't bring my phone up here, so I have no idea what time it is. What time is it? What is it? 818. 818, okay. Well. So I'll try to not preach too, too long tonight. I know you've been at it for a while. It gets a little... These conferences are where you're at. So I'm going to weave together as best I can tonight a couple of dreams and, and then a word from the Lord that was given to me. I feel, I feel the reason the Lord wants to do this is uh, uh, sometimes it's good to just back up and, and see the big picture, not get so deep in the forest, right? can't see it for the trees and also when I go back and revisit some of these dreams and some of these words from the Lord it, uh, it's really been interesting to me the last several years as I have um, watched the Lord so in such an incredible way bring things together and, and, and weave things together and bring, take me back to things that I had moved on from. Uh, you know, you think, I think we, we've done that, we've, we've, we've prayed that through, we've responded the way we should have, and then a year or two goes by and the Lord lets me know or shows me somehow that, no, this is just another phase of that. And what's happening now is still connected to this so I'm gonna you've heard me if you if you've uh, if you do read the posts and if you saw any of the conference at Tim's you heard some of this um, but I'm gonna visit a couple of these dreams again because I think they're a real good uh, big picture for us of some of what God is doing right now <coughs> You know, you realize just a few years ago, God's having to do more than send revival. God's having to rebuild. You know, even though reset has been taken by others, I still use that term because we are being reset by heaven. And they can't have that word. That's our word. <laughs> so, but it's not just a reviving. It's, a, it's almost a resurrection. But we're going to get there, amen? Yes. So the first one is this, this uh, dream that Greg had, Greg Hood, where different uh, er eras of Ameri Americans, different times of history, were ringing the Liberty Bell. And so in the beginning of the dream, Greg and I were walking in Philadelphia, Came to, the, came to Constitution Hall, Liberty Bell, and there's a group uh, there, and we see a young boy who um, reaches down, and it's interesting, he picks up a gavel, and he rings the bell with the gavel. But on either side of the street, this has fascinated me for two years. Greg had this dream two years ago. On either side of the street are 
two animals. One is an elephant and one's a donkey. <laughs> you have to be real very prophetic to figure that one out, do you? <laughs> so here's what's fascinating. I mean, and I don't think you know, I've tried to pray into this. I don't think so much of I mean you have to think of the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, but I don't think the Lord's trying to zero in on those parties. I think he's trying to awaken us to the political spirit behind what happens in our, in our nation. But it's interesting that the, the young boy represents a young America. And of course the Liberty Bell represents our connection to the Lord and our assignment to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, proclaim liberty throughout the land, all the inhabitants thereof. Leviticus 25.10, but that's a Jubilee verse. Most of you know that. Jubilee is all about Jesus, our Jubilee. So the fact that that was, uh, that bell was rung on, on our birth, or at least within a day or two of our birth as a nation, I think makes very clear what God had in mind for us that we, we are called to be those who ring the gospel bell throughout the earth and proclaim his liberty, not just a natural liberty. But every time someone would do it in a dream, when this young boy stepped up and rang the bell, then the elephant and the donkey went to the middle of the street and started fighting. So they weren't just, in this dream, they weren't just fighting each other. They were hindering the destiny of the nation. And they were trying to, they were trying to kill each other. They were, vicious, they were fighting viciously. So then the scene changed and it moved forward in time to Abraham Lincoln's day, Civil War era. And he steps up to the bell with a gavel, and he rings the bell. And sure enough, the elephant and the donkey run to the middle of the street and start fighting viciously, trying their best to kill each other, the other one. And he said by this time in the dream, they were bloody mess. So then the scene changed, the era changed again, and it was our era. Streets, you could tell, and then he started seeing people he knew that were stepping up to the bell, using the same gavel, ringing the bell. And at this point, the donkey and elephant were just going crazy. Well, duh. <coughs> That's pretty accurate, isn't it? <laughs> and they were just, just tearing one another up. So now, keep in mind, keep the picture here. Every time God was trying to restore and move America toward... When I shared this in Ohio, let me just stop here and say, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck came up and began to talk about it and, and said... That bell represents our God. I've never heard that said before. I've heard our destiny, our assignment, our calling. No, he said, no, 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 covenant. Our covenant, that, that is a picture of our covenant with God. And then he said, it's our, it's our uh, ram's horn. It's our shofar. So every time this is ringing... This political spirit rises up, and you can't hear the bell anymore. All you can hear is the fighting. So then at, at this point in the dream, uh, spiritual leaders have stepped up, and they begin to ring the bell. First it was just a young boy 
picturing a young nation. Then it's Abraham Lincoln re representing the president. But I think the Lord was saying to us, at some point, the church has to step forward. Which I believe we are. I believe we are. Thank you. <laughs> but as these leaders in the church, the body of Christ, were ringing the bell, then uh, out of Independence Hall, that's pretty pro prophetic, isn't it? Out of our independence, out of our beginning, out of our government, constitution, all that, out of, the, out of Independence Hall, I walked out with one of the Supreme Court justices. And of course, I always feel like in these dreams, I represent not me, but the prayers of the church, the praying church. That's my assignment. Stir the people to pray, keep them praying. So it's not, it's not like I have to do this, or it's about me, it's about us. If you're an intercessor, if you pray for America, if you're part of the apostolic prophetic prayer movement in this nation, then this is about you. So we walk out, I walk out with this justice, current, a current Supreme Court justice. And we go by this crowd of uh, leaders that are ringing the bell, and one of them hands it to this justice. They won't, they won't, they won't, wow, you know, we need to honor this justice, the Supreme Court justice, and let them ring the bell. And this person took it, but handed it to me and said, I can't strike the bell until you strike the bell. And that's been messing with me for two years. <laughs> because I know, I realized what God was saying. He said, Church, you need to stop looking to the natural government to fix this mess. It's not that they don't have a role, because this person did before the dream's over, have a role. She didn't, they didn't say, they didn't say, I can't do it. They, they said, I can't do it until you do it. And of course, strike, paga. It's the Hebrew word for intercession, which one of the primary meanings of that word is to strike. Strike the mark, or, or it's used to, um, to picture a lightning bolt. Striking. That's the word, intercession, paga. So it's ob this obvious play on words. I can't strike this. I can't, I can't do anything about it until you, church, step forward and do what you need to do. So I took the gavel, and I rang the bell. And when I did, an angel and an eagle were released from the heavens. They began to soar and fly to us. And, of course, the elephant and the donkey were in the street again. But the eagle began to war against both of them. And the angel was overseeing this. And the eagle killed both the donkey and the elephant. The political sphere. The, it, at first, just descended like it would be uh, going after a fish maybe in the lake or in the water. But instead of you know, trying to pick it up, the eagle just took its talons and just plucked both eyes out. Then did the same thing to the other animal. Now they're blind and then he just went and landed on the back of each one, one at a time of course, and 
just begin to, with these beak, dig into the back until he got to the backbone and killed both. <coughs> then he flew over and landed on the bell and sat there. And the angel brought the gavel back to me. They had taken it from me. And I went to the justice and said, here, now we can do this together. In other words, when that political spirit was dealt with. And I don't honestly know what that looks like. I just know that. I just know we have to break that hold. It might, might look like 45. I'm not sure. But I, I shouldn't have said that, should I? I said, now we can do this together. Uh, so this justice took the gavel and began to ring the bell. And when they did, uh, uh, well, they'll say that. At that point, the angel came to me with, this is kind of hard to tell quickly, because if you don't know this story, it kind of doesn't make the impact that it needs to. But the angel came to us at that point and gave to each one of us, me and the justice, a mercy coin. So a mercy, the mercy coin, or these replica of coins, uh, minted. They're not legal tender, but they they look real. I mean, they're 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 minted. They're, you know, they're real silver, and they look just like a coin. But back when we were, Ken and Tim and I were at the White House, outside the White House, praying in 2000. 16, I guess it was. So we had, uh, we had been literally assigned by the Lord prophetically to go there and pray. In fact, I had been told by the Lord to stop going into D.C. for a season. And the Lord said, I'll tell you when to go back. Just go to the States and stir prayer and just leave that place alone for a while. And that's what, what I did. And he said, I'll let you know when it's time to start going back in there. So, a week before this that I'm about to tell you about occurred, I was on the phone talking to my daughter, who was Hannah, who was my assistant. And I don't know what we were talking about, but Cece barged into the room and just interrupted the conversation and said, I've just heard from the Lord, it's time to go back to D.C. And we didn't pick up on her urgency, so she, she I just kind of nodded and kept talking, and she said, no, I don't mean like generally, it's time. She said, I just heard the Lord say, now go to D.C. Well, I knew that didn't mean that minute, but make the plans and do this. So I, thought, I said, Hannah, change my pl plans next make, week, my flights, and get me tickets to D.C. I'm going to D.C. This was, I think, probably a Wednesday. We had a conference that we were hosting over the weekend, so I couldn't, couldn't do that. But I had the tickets, and I invited uh, Tim and Ken to go along and they said yes so we all had our tickets then we did our conference DSM did an appeal to heaven conference well Chuck was there he didn't know anything about this he didn't know we had tickets to DC he didn't know what CeCe had said but he spoke and then he prophesied he pulled out one of these valves somebody mentioned today it's a railroad spike painted gold when you paint it gold it's no longer a railroad spike it's a valve and a valve is a Hebrew letter that uh, represented a year, that year on the calendar, which represented connecting heaven and earth, staking claim, 
It's a lot of prophetic symbolism. So he'd pass them out to people as a symbolic thing and, you know, just a reminder. So anyway, he's prophesying. He pulls this out, called me up, and starts prophesying. The Lord says, go to D.C., he didn't know he didn't know we had our tickets. Take this to DC and restate claim to America. So he finishes his prophecy and I take the microphone and say this was probably Saturday or Sunday, the last day of the conference. I take the mic and I say, Well, Monday, we're gonna be there. We already have our tickets. So we go, we went over on assignment, and so, you know, we, 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 we're thinking, you know, where do we bury this vow? And not go to jail. Right. <laughs> so the first place we went to pray was at the White House. We're in the park <clears throat> across the street. We actually, on the edge, we're, we... we we get as far away from the people, they get up close to the fence, we get as far away from there as we can, off to the side, and so we can just kind of be, have private time to pray. You know, we're not drawing attention to ourselves, we, you would just think we were conversing with one another, but we're really praying. And then sometimes we would split up and, and walk in different directions, and then come back and talk about what we were hearing, and what we felt like we needed to pray and decree, and we're also trying to discern, is this where, I mean, we can't really do it, we're not going to try to reach through the fence and do it at the White House, but maybe here in the park. We don't know where we're supposed to do this. So we've been for an hour, hour and a half, I don't know, and somebody says, are we finished here? Is there a, and I think it's Ken, he said, I don't, no, I don't think so. So we start praying again, and that's when we, that's when we out of the corner of our, our eyes, we, we see this old, older gentleman walking toward us. Slowly, never made eye contact, came from about 50 yards away, and never really made eye contact with us, kept his head down. I thought he was coming to talk to us. I thought maybe he's a panhandler and want some money. I didn't know what it was. I was a little annoyed, actually, because I thought he, he would have to know we're over here trying to be private. And he's, when he got within 20 feet or so, he's obviously coming toward us. No, there was no one else around us. But when he, maybe 10 feet away, then you, we could see, well, he's not going to, he's not coming directly to us. He's going to, he's on a trajectory here that's going to be put him about three or four feet in front of us. And so he just kept walking with his head down. And he, he said, when he got to where we could hear him, he said six times, mercy. Mercy. He just said it six Mercy, 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 mercy. By that time, he's passed us. We're just looking at each other. We're in a kind of a little circle. Yeah, it was raining. And we just, and somebody said, was that an angel? And somebody else said, that was an angel. And then somebody else said, let's talk to him. <laughs> and we looked, tried to get his attention. He wouldn't stop. And then he went into this crowd and disappeared. We couldn't find him. He was an angel. So we, we knew that the Lord was saying to us, I'm not, I don't want, my heart is not to, to destroy or to, to, to judge this nation. I look at America like as a prodigal. When I had my encounter with the Lord in 2000 and he downloaded his heart to me for America, uh, he didn't download anger into me. I have zero doubt that there's been, there have been plenty of times God has been very angry with us. But that's, that's not what he did. That's not what he was communicating to me as his heart for America. It was a grieving of a father over a prodigal. So, and and we, we knew from this encounter that God was saying, I am offering America mercy. 
That's when I knew that, well, I shouldn't say this. I don't want to be one of the donkeys or elephants, so I'll just be non-political. That's when I knew that one of the people running was not going to win because I knew that this person would not have been mercy. I guess if you know your history, you, you know who didn't win anyway, and you know who I'm talking about, so I, I blew that one, but anyway. So then, then another uh, 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 intercessor had a dream, and in the dream, she said, you, you speaking about me, she said, you, you kept saying over and over in this dream, and that's all you would say in the dream, I have tapped into a root of mercy. And she said, you say it again, you'd say it differently. I've tapped in to a root of mercy. And then you'd say, I've tapped into a root of mercy. And just over and over. So then we did our conference, you know, just a couple weeks later, another conference. And that's when a friend of mine had a, had a vision. And he saw it raining coins. And before the deluge was finished, he was ankle deep in coins. And he reached down and picked them up, and they looked just like U.S. coins, but all of them across the top had the word mercy. And uh, different statements, like one of them had a flag on the back uh, of the coin, and instead of saying old glory, it said new glory. New glory. But all of them said mercy. But well, he was so he was so impacted by this. He literally started making the, had, having these coins made, and, and sell them to people. And people, I have several of them. So in the dream, the angel flew to us and gave me a mercy coin and the justice a mercy coin. And that's pretty significant. That God's still saying. He's still saying. I want. To show mercy. To this nation. I want. The bell to ring. And. We took our coins. To. Independence Hall and each of us laid them on the Declaration of Independence and said now we're free we're free so I took way too long on that so now I have to speed up this plan I had. I don't think it's going to work now, so I'm, I'm changing it on the fly. Audible, audible, Omaha, Omaha. What, some of you don't know what that's about. <clears throat> so a few months later, he has another dream about the bell. And this dream is same place there in Philadelphia dream starts he and I again in front of Independence Hall Liberty Bell's there in front of us we see a group of people gather around doing something to the bell and they're messing with the covenant the destiny the shofar And I look at him and I say, I know those people. I know those people. They were always friends of mine. One of them was Bill Hammond. The two other, well, I knew two of them were friends of mine. The, and the other, one of the others, I don't have his permission, so I'm, I don't say his name publicly, but he was there, and Bishop Hammond was there, and a different Supreme Court justice. And I walk up to them and I say, what are you guys doing? They say, well, Angel brought each of us here independently of the other. 
and said, I need you to go to Philadelphia and retune the Liberty Bell. I said, we're trying to, we're, trying, we want, we're here to do that, but we're not sure how to do it. They had taken the bell out of the cradle it sits in, and they said, here on the inside of the bell, or on the lip, but inside, there's a statement and we know it's a statement that tells you how to retune the bell. But it's in a language we can't read. And maybe you can help us with that. And I said, well, Hood, this is Greg Hood, he had a dream again. I called him by his last name. Well, Hood, you're, you're good at that stuff. Interpret that language for us. He goes over and looks at it, and he says, wow, this is the language of angels. And it says, if the Liberty Bell, or if the bell ever needs retuning, tune it to frequency 528, which is a real frequency. Some say it's a, a frequency that's, they say it's been proven to bring healing in, to certain parts of the body. I don't, I don't know what I think about all that, but that's what they say. I think it's just to sell music video, but it's anyway. <laughs> what, I think it, what I think it's saying is uh, it's, it's the number of the word in Strong's for a meeting, an encounter. And because of, because of something said later in the dream, I think that's what it means. Well, I'll tell you now. It'll make more sense to you now, even though we didn't see it till the end of the dream. Well, I can't tell you now. Anyway. <laughs> so I say, I love these dreams because God can just do anything in a dream, you know. So I speak up and I said, Wow, you're kidding. 528. I just happen to have a tuning fork in my pocket that tunes to the frequency of 528. How convenient. So later in the dream, we, we didn't notice it until after we had done it, but on one of the times, there were, there were words on each of the tines on the tuning fork. One side said, Heaven and earth, five to eight. And I think it's the word meeting or encounter. The way you tune the bell is heaven and earth have to meet. The other two words were awakening and alignment. You want awakening, you've got to get things realigned, and you've got to get heaven and earth to meet. But anyway, so now we, have the, we, we know what it says, and we have the tuning fork. And I speak up and I tell Bishop Hammond, and, and, and the Supreme Court Justice is just, they're just thrilled. They're so excited. He, he looks at me and says, I, I don't know how we were going to do this, but I know now we can do this. So I said, okay, now, and, and, and we get ready to, to, to ring, the, to, to sound the tuning fork. But I stopped him and I said, uh, you have to hit it on this book. And it's a book that inside has the Constitution. And it has stories from the past of revivals in America. So there has to be a, a, an agreement with history and God's purposes and past revivals. So you're going to have to hit it on this book. They were also in the book we've, later. We didn't know it at the time. There were seeds, and they were seeds of revival. But I said, you have to hit this book, and then, so they're getting ready to hit the book, and I said, whoa, 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 whoa. It only works, this tuning fork only works when it's being held by an apostle and a prophet. So, Bishop you know, Bill Hammond grabbed it and grabbed my hand, and we both held on to that together. 
and hit it and it made this sound very clear and strong and the justice then was tuning the bell by moving the pin that's there in the crack of the Liberty Bell. So he's listening to the tuning fork and he's moving this pin to get it to the right sound. Which I found very fascinating because I actually saw a promise in that. That God's going to He's not going to destroy us. He's going to use our brokenness and our, yeah. our weakness. He's going to bring his redemption into it. And, yeah. He's even going to use our mistakes. So we finally get it just right. Everybody's really excited. Is where, well, I'm skipping through lots of it, but, but when, it, when the bell was tuned properly and we rang it again, the sound reverberated and got louder and louder and louder and it eventually filled Philadelphia and then it filled all of Pennsylvania and then it filled all of the nation. And Greg said in, in the dream, this, this, this vibration was so incredibly strong, powerful, that it was penetrating every living thing in America. Just go into them and there was this wholeness, this life that was flowing into all of the nation through the sound of this gospel bell. And then a wind came blew the book out of my hand and the pages opened and all these seeds started flying everywhere and that's when we knew realized they were seeds of revival so we were all excited and started saying our goodbyes and okay well we got that done you know and then Greg looked at me or I looked at him actually and I said because we started walking toward Independence Hall, I said, I'm going to need that key I gave you a few years ago. I gave you a key. Uh, it's a memento, a souvenir thing, but it's a key to Independence Hall. So, you know, you hang it on the wall, whatever. But I, was, I went to minister for Greg in Hawaii when he had his church over there several years ago. The Lord told me to take that key and give it to him. And pray over him, prophesy over him, and I did. Of course, that's what's fascinating is, now, I didn't know why the Lord said do that. And that was literal in the natural realm. And then the Lord sneaks it in a dream. <laughs> so I look at him, and I say, uh, now I'm going to need that key I gave you to Independence Hall. God could just do anything in a dream. Greg said, well, good, I happen to have it with me right here. <laughs> so we walked over and unlocked Independence Hall. We unlocked the purpose, the destiny the root, the reason God created us. We unlocked liberty, we unlocked destiny, we unlocked all that we're supposed to be and do. And we went inside, I know it's fascinating, we got inside, this is kind of the end of the dream, just, I think the Lord does some of this stuff just kind of make us smile. We get inside and part of it has become a restaurant. And on the wall is the verse from Psalms that says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. The two verses. 
So, you know, I get so much of this, these things sent to me. Sometimes, I used to get so excited when I get a dream sent to me, and it's like, oh. Because some of these dreams, you know, you just have to dig into them for, for a while to get them. They're not easy. Oh, that, that, that new wine dream, I don't know how many of you saw that on the post, but I called him a couple times. I said, you didn't, do, you didn't get this dream. You're messing with me. There's no way you could remember all these numbers and words. And he said, when I have a dream like that, it's like a photographic memory. There's no other part of my life that ever works that way, but when I wake up from a dream like that, I can see every minute detail, no matter how long the dream is, no matter how many words or numbers are in it, I can see every one of them. And I'm studying it, you know, and thinking to myself, he, one of the, at least one of these is going to be wrong. <laughs> the date's not going to work with the wine and the person and all that. And of course they all did. But then the Lord sometimes because I get so distracted with so much happening and so many sent to me he just like just supernaturally somehow take me back there. So I, when I get this call from, from the attorney uh, a few weeks ago and he says I want you to I want, I want, I want you to I want to invite you to do something, but first I want you to know if you think what I believe God spoke to me could really be God speaking to me. Because what I heard was that on the opening day of this session, Supreme Court session, we're supposed to go consecrate the court. Re, we're rededicate, consecrate the court, the Supreme Court. Can we do that? I thought, I don't know if we can do that or not. Then I knew, it just wasn't, very, very quickly I knew it was the Lord. I said, this is right. But that was very impactful to me because I knew what it meant if God was really saying, do that. Because I, I, I know the words in the Old Testament for consecrate, sanctify. I know the words of the New Testament. I know what they mean. I know when they did those things and what it meant when they did it. Because it wasn't, uh, in that day it wasn't an experience somebody hit at the altar and you got up and said they're sanctified. It was a setting apart of a person or thing to God for his use and purpose. So, you know, you consecrated not only people back then, you consecrated, they consecrated buildings, utensils clothing, dates, anything that was set apart to God for his use. You could, kadash. And anytime God was about to do something very significant in the life of Israel, he always told the leaders, tell the people to kadash, consecrate themselves because I'm about to come and do something significant. So when I had studied that, I knew that. So I was saying, okay, Lord, if you're saying this, it means you're about to do something very significant in America. It does involve the courts. It does involve the strong man that's lived there, Baal. You're about to do something that's very important. And the court's connected. And, and so, you know, I'm just... Anyway, I go do this, but, but that takes me back to these dreams. I said, Lord, I said, Lord, it seemed to me like there was a donkey dream or something about the court or justices, and I find it and find them. And I realize they're still just as appropriate today as they were two years ago. We're still obviously in this retuning process. He's trying to deal with this spirit that fights our destiny, fights his purposes, fights our freedom, fights our liberty. 
And I will say it this time. I will say it. This is why they hate Donald Trump. Because he's not in that system. And so, not, you know, people from all of one party hate, hate him, but many people in the Republican Party hate him. And somehow, I don't, you know, I don't know how God makes some people the way he makes some people, but this man doesn't care. He just doesn't care. And if they, you know, well, but, but, but by thinking, doing what they're doing, thinking they've just, they're destroying this man, they're just making it worse. <laughs> I think they're about to get their eyeballs plucked out. <laughs> and, but the point is, what God intended to be who we are first and foremost spiritually as a nation with a destiny from him for the nations of the earth for his purposes just keeps being overtaken and defiled by this government we have this political spirit. I don't know what this is, where some of this is going, but I know a part of the shaking that's coming is going to help deal with that political stronghold in America. So I'm just saying all that to say we're still in this retuning process. And we're trying to get this meeting between heaven and earth and the alignment the other time that needs to happen so that legally justice what needs to happen can get the bell retuned and we are getting pretty close we're getting close I know it because of what I sense here my spirit I know we're, I know we're moving much closer because of what I see happening I know just even for God to, to bring back to me dreams like this and take me to D.C. To be a part of a re-consecrating the court. All of these things are, are saying to me, we're coming to a, uh, what's the right word, maybe a Gettysburg maybe, I don't know. There's coming a battle that will seal the deal. And so... Because the church has, not all the church, but enough of the church, has risen to action, we can do this now. Yeah. I can't strike the bell until you strike the bell. And I think one of the most incredible the, the most incredible part of that entire command the forward, paint the borders, uh, bury the arrowhead, all that stuff. What the, the most incredible part of that whole thing is I didn't plan that. We stepped in at a certain point and, and realized we need to step in and start helping and get the website and organize this some. I did not, we did not plan any of that. We just started getting calls from people and emails and letters. We're doing this. All I did was talk about the dream and put it out there. I say, you know, pray, do this. Well, you know. And all of a sudden, there's this grassroots movement 
of hundreds of thousands of people now who are doing what God showed us to do. And nobody's, nobody's telling them how to do it. Nobody's saying, you, this state, you do it this way, you do it this way. People just started contacting us and saying, we're, we're doing this. That, that tells me the ecclesia has, gone, has come to a point where there's some maturity. They hear from God. And when they heard from God, they knew how to do this and what to do. When we read the reports, it wasn't like, oh, God, what a bunch of flaky people. <laughs> it was, I'm sitting and weep. I think, oh, I can't believe. I just think that had to be God telling them to do this. And the unity and the, just all that took place, it was just so God. So we are now striking the bell. The destiny, the purpose of God, the plan of God, the, the roots of our nation, of who we are. And you know what we're going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do, Ken. Finish this. Yeah. Joe, at the end, I don't know if I said this in the post, I couldn't do all the new wine details, is that dream? But at the end, you know, we're about to, the, the wine's ready and it's in the bottles, we're about to See them released into the nation. And the river of wine's going to flow. Whoop, that's all somewhere. <laughs> but Hodges shouts, it's ready. Let's go finish this. Yeah. I remember our friend Don Lynch, we were praying over the election stuff back in 20. Maybe it may have been early 21, I don't know, but when we were in Arizona. He, he, he just had an encounter with the Lord, and you know, Don's in heaven now, but he, the Lord had taken him to the story of David and Goliath. After he hit Goliath with the stone, then he took Goliath's sword and finished it. And the Lord, maybe it was a dream, but the Lord kept saying to him, Finish this! Finish this. I can still hear it. He was just beside himself telling the story. Finish this. Well, I think he's in heaven right now saying, if you, I'm coming down to get you if you don't finish this. We're going to finish this. We're going to finish So I'm going to pray for a few couple minutes. I don't know what you have planned. You, you want to take it longer, then you can get the team up here and, and you can pray into it with me. But I'm just going to lead us in a couple, few, two or three minutes of prayer. Okay? You want to stand? You want to sit? Stand? If you want to sit, sit. But those that want to stand can stand. Lord, we are constantly amazed at your ability to reveal, show us what to do, how to do it, speak to this one, that one, all that you, you're doing. We are so impressed with you. And Lord, we, we des we're desperate people. We're desperate. We realized quite some time back, other, other, uh, apart from your mercy and supernatural help, it, it, we're too far gone. There's too much decay, there's too much evil, there's, we've lost too much. almost like Lord I feel like I just it's like a tree 
defilement is almost to the root. But you tell us over and over, you tell us, you show us, you preserve the root. You've preserved that calling. You've preserved who we are. Though we have these agendas, and they'd rather fight for power than see liberty ring. They've created such a discord, confusion, hatred. They divide us intentionally. They, they do everything they can do to, to stop the ringing of that bell and to change the broken covenant with you. They don't like who we are at the root. They want power. They want money, control. Some of them don't even know what they want. Lord, you keep telling us, I'm going to redeem and restore. I'm going to reset. I'm going to rebuild. I'm going to re reform, reconstitute, redeem. I'm going to do this. As long as we keep striking, Hagah, praying, declaring what you said, exalting you, refusing to back up and be intimidated by spirits and threats and the government powers that censor and harass. As long as we just stand, your response is the same. I'm going to do this. Lord, we're going to see this happen. And we're going to finish this. We're not going to stop until the veil is perfectly in tune. We're not going to stop until we walk across the street, take the key, and unlock Independence Hall. We're not going to stop until the wind of heaven blows the seeds out of the book of the Constitution and past the revival of the testimonies and blows those seeds into the nation. We're not going to stop until we see them. We we're not going to stop then. We're just going to do things differently and start, start, start reaping the fruit, discipling the fruit. We have come to a significant place in this process. We have come to a place where I believe you're showing us we can finish now this assignment to break the hold of Baal off of America and expel him from that home he's lived in for 50, 60 years called the Supreme Court and rule the, rule the, rules the nation from there. But we've come to a place of breakthrough. This, I believe, I'm talking to you, us now. And this, I believe, is why these principalities around the world are so intense anger angry and trying desperately to create unrest and turmoil and violence and all this because they are very, very nervous. But we're not going to let them win because we've been given authority over principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and wicked spirits in high places. 
And it's not about us, it's about our King who defeated and dethroned them. And we don't do this in our own strength and in our name, we do this in the strength and the authority of the Lord Himself. We are His voice. So we pledge right now to you, Father, we're going to finish this. No matter what happens, we are anchored and we've been painted with the anointing. The ecclesia is made for stand. Now we're going to finish this. Father, I tonight decree that the mercy of the Lord God will come upon the ecclesia of this nation. That there will be a mercy that releases the finisher anointing into the ecclesia in Jesus' name. We say to the ecclesia across America, rise up, finish this. Rise up, finish this. Rise up, finish this. Father, we decree from Hawaii all the way to New York, Alaska all the way down to Miami, and every point in between, that there is an ecclesia that is arising with a finishing anointing that will bring redemption, Lord, to this nation. We cry out, the mercy of God prevails. We say over America that mercy triumphs over judgment in your Jesus name and we decree that you are a nation that's coming under the cover of mercy you're coming under the co covering of mercy father I say that you will cover this nation in your mercy in your shoe
Father, we declare tonight that the food of the ecclesia is to do your will and to finish your work. We decree that finishing anointing rising up on our insides this night to the glory of Jesus' name to win for the Lamb that was slain, the rewards of His suffering. We declare a finishing anointing, a breakthrough finishing anointing, rising up within the ecclesia this day, shaking her from the inside out, causing new tears to be born, Lord God, over the mourner's bench once again. We pray, Father, for cries rising up from the bowels deep within the saints of God, crying out, on my son have mercy on my daughter have mercy on my city have mercy on my state god let that finishing anointing arise let tears begin to fall god until we finish this work <laughs> lord we ask your forgiveness for the generations that we pour too much religion into and we left them alone to serve fail you today about something I have uh, shared before. I don't think I've ever shared here, but I am finding myself read, drawn back to this word. And it could be because of what's happening in Israel, I'm not sure, but I don't think it is. I think it's, it's uh, specifically for us here, not here in this meeting, but in our nation. And so I received a word from Chuck about a year ago, Chuck Pierce. Uh, Ken alluded to him. He's, he's a troublemaker. <laughs> I 
I couldn't tell you how many times he's been used by the Lord to give me one line. He, he gives me very few prophetic words in the sense of a full prophecy. Uh, most of the time the Lord uses Chuck to give me a phrase. And that phrase will launch me into a study or a uh, teaching. And of course, by now, we both know that's why the Lord does it that way with him, with me. So I'm not surprised when he gives me a one-liner and he'll say, this is all I heard, but the Lord said, tell you this. And so this phrase was, um, there will be a return to Gilgal. For, for America, he says, it's a word for America. America will re return. There will be a return to Gilgal. So I know enough about uh, that to, to have a general sense about uh, what it could mean. But I've also felt that I, at the time and now again, that I needed to go back and, and look at a, at a more detailed uh, in a, in a more detailed way, at the context, to see what nuances and, of meaning and what uh, hidden meanings. There's a lot of symbolic things associated with with Gilgal. So I told Ken, I'm not really sure why I'm drawn to this today, but I've been drawn to this subject for two days. I almost went there last night, but uh, we'll just see and maybe... When we get into it a little more, we'll know why. But Gilgal is the place that uh, Israel camped after they crossed the Jordan River under Joshua's leadership. And uh, it was called Gilgal not because, um, well, Gilgal means rolling, the place of rolling, as in rolling. And a lot of people think it's called that because um, there the Jordan River was rolled back, allowing them to cross. Which is really not true, by the way, because it wasn't rolled back, it was cut off. But I'll get to that in a minute. So, the Lord said it's, it's, it's Gilgal, We're, I'm naming it Gilgal, not because of that, but because this day the reproach is, is rolled off of you. The reproach of Egypt, the reproach of your slavery, your bondage, it's, rolled, it's now been officially, and it's interesting uh, how the Lord did a lot of things in this passage with great specificity of timing and precise, you know, definitely led by him places. So he said, it's rolled off. And while I just felt like if the Lord's saying, we're going to go back to Gilgal, you know, just without any in-depth study, it means several things. It means we're going to make it through this horrible season in America. And I, I'm talking about a broad season now. The decades that has brought us to this place of of devastation and shame and godlessness and rebellion and pathetic perversion and stupidity and just all kinds of stuff. Well, I felt like the Lord was, was, was encouraging me that we are going to finish this. As we said last night, you can finish this and get this reproach off of this nation. But it also means, doesn't it, that we are under a reproach and some maybe some curses. And I also felt like when he said it to me that I knew it was the, the timing of it was important. I, I feel like 
we're in this uh, window, not like a day or two window, but you know, a year or two window is what I have felt of making certain decisions, praying and following his direction, leadership that are going to um, finish this process of getting us to a revival and a, and a transformation. I do still feel, I know you can tell this from last night, I do still feel that there is a shaking coming. And uh, it's important for us to know that the praying that God told us to do and that we did, uh, He never said that was going to stop the shaking from happening. He said you're going to be protected through it and restored through it. And it's, it, it, it could either be dis destroy us or it could be used to transform us and, and restore. And I think we, that was going to be decided by us, yeah. not the Lord. I think he was saying, you can go this way or you can go this way. So, I still feel it's coming. Um, and I feel we, sh we, sh need to, we need to continue to pray. You know, there's always, a tenant, there's always the, the danger when you have an assignment like that, that you think it's all over when you finish that assignment. But we're in a we're we're on a journey and a process with the Lord toward this right now. It's like when you when you defeat Jericho, the next little little tiny town that they thought was a pushover. You know they thought Jericho was going to be the toughest, and God gave it to them so uh, supernaturally, and it was so easy. And then the next one, they thought, oh, this would be a piece of cake, and they got their hind ends kicked because you know anyway. So there's always a tendency to to slack off and, and think, well, we've we've we we we're there now. But I think um, we have some shaking to go through. But I think the Lord is saying to us, um, you're going to come out on the other side stronger and better. And and by the way, I don't know what that shaking is. You know, I've said on the post, I don't know what it is, or alluded to that at least. So uh, I want you to know that I don't know. I'm not just think, saying, I'm not just refusing to say it and acting like I don't. I don't know. I don't know anybody that, that in, I don't know any prophet in America, there may be some, that, would, that I know that would stand confidently and say, as a word, I know this is a word from God, that this is what is going to happen. I think several of them have leanings and thoughts, and they think it's this, they think it's that. But I don't know of anybody that's been willing to go on the line and say, this is what it is. So, you know, for whatever reasons, the Lord uh, has not shown that. And of course, and I, don't, I guess I'm spending too much time on this, but to me it's just so connected to the Gilgal thing. God is saying, if, if we stay the course, and we just keep walking with him through this, that he's going to orchestrate events in a way that this works toward a resetting, um, a restoring, a, a redeeming of the nation, and we're going to be fine. But I think it's going to be challenging. So just, just think it's uh, it's not going to be just some easy thing. Anyway, well, now that I have you all edified, uh, <laughs> so. Let's go back for a, a, a couple of chapters before we get to Gilgal and talk about the crossing. Because God is obviously using that account and the way they crossed 
to picture the cross, which, which now makes it applicable for us because it's all painting a picture of something Jesus is going to do. Actually, Joshua's name used to be Jehoshua, or I mean, uh, well, I got to forget these names. But anyway, his name was changed to Jeho- Joshua, shortened form of Jehoshua, which means the Lord is, or God is, or Jehovah, Yahweh is salvation, because he was going to be such a type of Christ who led them into their inheritance. Hoshea, wasn't that his name originally? Any scholars in here can... Anyway, so it's all being set up by God years before this, you know, that Moses, when he has to step down, this is the man that's going to take him in because he's going to be this type of Christ. Well, then when you get to the time they're about to do it, um, the account, it becomes, it becomes clear that this is, a, this is a prophetic picture of the cross. Jordan is a picture of, uh, the Jordan River is a picture of spiritual death. It flows from uh, the north, and the, and the passage very clearly says it flows into the Arabah, which is the wilderness or the desert, and then the Dead Sea. So we're meant to see this river that feeds spiritual death and destruction where nothing can live. And that's why when the water rolled back, it rolled back to Adam. And most people know that. Or most of you probably have heard that. But the, but the Jordan River didn't roll back a mile, a, a mile or so for all these people to get across, or be, was it cut off a mile or so upstream or a few hundred yards. It's, it was almost 20 miles upriver from where they were, where God cut it off. And he did that because he went all the way upstream to a town called Adam. I guess I can tell by some of the wows that some of you didn't know that. But he's obviously painting this picture. So he, he goes all the way back to Adam and cuts off the river of death that's feeding the wilderness, the barren, sterile wilderness, and the dead sea of humanity where nothing can live. So he's obviously painting this picture. And so then that's why the Ark of the Covenant had to go into the Jordan first. Because that's a picture of Jesus. It's where the blood, you know, was sprinkled there on the mercy seat. So it's a picture of the cross. Coming out on the other side is a picture. It pictures the resurrection. They build two memorials, just like our communion. One they built in the Jordan River, which is a picture of death. So he said, build a memorial there. The memorial, it, it pictures the cross. Remember my death. And then you come out on the other side, and he said, build one more memorial here on the, on the uh, Canaan side, the inheritance side, picturing resurrection. The ark had to stay in the Jordan River bed while everybody crossed. So he didn't just go first and come on out the other side. It went into the Jordan River bed after the Lord cut off the water, obviously. Then it stayed there. For how long? A day, maybe? While these thousands of people and animals and everybody came across. And that's a picture of us being crucified with Christ. Entering in with Him. It's all very symbolic. When they came out on the other side... They camped at Gilgal. He still did not name the place Gilgal for immediately. 
He waited until after they crossed. All the men had to be circumcised because they were not circumcised during the wandering in the wilderness. They had abandoned the covenant. And so that was an exciting, fun time for a day or so. <laughs> and, and, and of course, circumcision is a, is a sign of covenant. The cutting off of the foreskin the, uh, of the male, it's a, the same word is used for cutting covenant. The word covenant comes from a word meaning cut. Because it happens through the shedding of blood. They had abandoned covenant. I'm, I'm listening while I'm talking, okay. So that's what's happened in America. We've abandoned our covenant with him. And that's what they had done. And the Lord said, you know, now that you're across and you're in the land, I, can't, I still can't give you your inheritance until covenant is restored. And that's a part of what we've been in the process of doing here in America. That's why God said command the forward. That's why he has sent some of us on uh, the assignments we've had over the years. I can't tell you how many places I've been on prayer assignments, many of which were specifically, we were told, go and renew covenant with the Lord intercessorily. In other words, standing in the gap for the nation. We did one entire seven-day tour to seven different places, and the, the Lord said, go retrace covenant, the, the places of covenant with me in this nation. So we're on this journey because we've done the same thing. But then he said, you know, you've got to, to do this circumcision thing. And then they celebrated Passover. Which is all about covenant. The couple of things... The, the, the miracles surrounding this crossing are just ridiculous. You know, when the Lord cut the water off, um, he also had to dry it up instantly. I mean, you, if, 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 if you cut off a flow of a river 20 miles upstream, it would be days before it would all the water would be gone, and then it would dry out, and you could cross them. I and God... God had to cut it off, and then he he had to do something. It was like some giant hair dryer in the sky or something. (laughs) So it's all, you know, I mean, and it's all fascinating. But another thing that's very fascinating to me is that the timing of this was so significant. So they, they, cross the, they, they cross the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month. Because it's going to be a picture of the cross. In preparing for the Passover lamb and the sacrifice, that's the day they chose the lamb. the tenth day of the month, they would choose what lamb they were going to offer. Passover was the fourteenth day of the month. When the Passover lamb was sacrificed, which is a picture of the cross, obviously, Christ our Passover. And on the fourteenth day of the month, The manna dried up, and they ate the produce of the land for the first time on the day after Passover. And God so much wanted us to know 
the importance of the timing and what all this pictured, that in the, in the text he, it says, on that very day. they ate the fruit of the land. He wants us to know, he wanted them to know, and he wants us to know that even after four centuries of activity from the time he gave Abraham the promise and then you know, we think about Isaac in the story and it's all, we, we, we compartmentalize these things, but that's like a that 25-year wait was just a, a, a small beginning of a long period of time to get all this ready. Israel and being able to use them and, as you know, the people he would, through whom he would bring Messiah. But you know, then after Isaac, 25 years, he's born, then he's got to get grow up and have kids, and, and then Jacob's got to grow up and have 12 sons, and. And Joseph has to do his thing, and then they have to go to Egypt, and they're slaves for ever. And so, long story short, it's been over four centuries. I just want you to let that sink in. It's been over four centuries since God told Abraham he was going to do that. For us, that's like going back to 1620 or 1600 or whatever. He is so amazing and powerful that he can navigate through 400 plus years of activity, sin, rebellious people, unbelief, marrying the wrong, sleeping with the maid and having a kid, and Jacob's issues and Isaac's issues and all these tribes' issues and selling Joseph issues and wandering around and then becoming slaves and all of this, and then Pharaoh won't let him go, and we've got to do all these plagues to get him out of here, and miracles, and, and now, they've got, now I've got a generation that still won't believe me, and I'm going to have to let them die out here and roam around, and who knows when they'll all die? Well, God did, because he brought them to the crossing. And out the other side, on the very day, that he intended for it to happen 400 plus years before this. And so when God started moving me and my heart back to Gilgal, one of the things he has been saying, he keeps saying to me, don't think I can't do this. This is why I say so often in the post, do not doubt this. His issue is never whether or not he can do it. His issue is us. And even if he can't get us to do it, in his foreknowledge, he knew he wouldn't get us to do it. So he planned to do it through the next generation. He wasn't caught off guard. He still gives us the choice. And I keep telling the Lord, I'm determined that when you looked ahead to this generation, you saw some people that were going to do it. So when all this garbage is happening around the world, demonized people are ruling countries and nations and including this one and you navigate through this mess and you navigate through wars and just all the stuff that goes on it's very important for us to remember he can get this exactly where he said he would get it when when he this has decided he would get us there 
This is why I'm not afraid of the, of the evil. I'm not afraid of Washington and what these people can do. I get very angry about it. I grieve over it. But I am never, ever worried that God can't do this. Quite frankly, there have been times when I've been a little nervous about the church. Is he going to find a people through whom he can do what he wants to do? Or has he, does he know he's going to have to find the next one? Next generation. I've come to the conclusion now he... he I don't have that doubt anymore. Because I see an ecclesia arising. So, a, wi a willing people. I see a willing people doing it. So now what am I asking the Lord? I'm saying, you know, why are you bringing me back to this Gilgal thing in my mind. Are we, are we about to cross over? And by the way, I wouldn't even try to do this message most places. I feel very much at home here with Ken and, and, with, and with you, and I'm just... I just uh, I'm real. I'm very comfortable with just saying, Lord, I'm not sure why you want to do this, but I'm going to get up there, talk about it, and see if we can land on it. Now, sometimes, you know, we should do this more often. Turn meetings into not preaching meetings, but prayer rooms and and congresses where we listen and hear and determine. I do feel like America is about to cross over. I just, I feel like there's something else he's trying to say through this. And maybe we have crossed over. Maybe we've crossed over and we're in this phase of re-covenanting with him. That's what really rings true. That's, that's what I'm feeling right now. I'm trying to be careful about what, you know, assuming, but I feel like what the Lord is saying is we, we must persevere in this uh, these prayers and decrees to recovenant this nation to the Lord. Yes. Maybe the shaking is the, the circumcising. You, you, we, we could not, if we're going to, if we're going to look at this as a picture and, and listen to the Lord through it, we can't. We can't uh, interpret it and assume that we can't, we're not back in covenant with the Lord in the way we need to as a ne be as a nation until all the demons are gone and all the bad leaders are gone and all the changes we want to see are made. That would be like Israel saying, you can't re-covenant to him until you get rid of all the giants and the Baal worship and the child sacrifices. And, and the Lord didn't say that. He came as the captain after they crossed over and after they were circumcised and recovenanted to him and ate the fruit of the land and fulfilled all these pictures. And now they're back in covenant with the Lord to celebrate Passover. And that's when the captain shows up. To Joshua. Just take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. So... You, you, 
He called, the, he called the place holy before the giants and the idols and the sin and the evil was gone. And he came to lead them into battle to, to accomplish these things before all those strongholds were gone. So the Lord's not saying to us, you can't recovenant this nation to me until you get rid of all the sin and all the junk. He is not saying that. He is saying the sin and the junk and all those things won't be gone until you do recovenant with me. Because